Stephen Moore, um, Richard Nixon famously said that it would take a genius to wreck the American <laughs> economy, and he was proven right, of course. It's a fantastic engine for prosperity, the greatest the world has ever seen. And from that, uh, economists uh, and, and observers g developed kind of a truism that while presidents have nothing to do with it and, and can only do harm if they try and fiddle with it, let's, let's leave the economy alone, and it hums along. And, and through the, the 70s and 80s and even the 90s, we all kind of chose to believe that. But now, reading what you've written and, and uh, what others have written about the, the present American economy, it does seem as if presidents are putting their stamp, uh, for better or for worse, more and more on the economy, and it's showing up, and uh, to wit, uh, the tax cut by uh, President Trump. And, and so it's as if the there's the, the gap between policy and practice is narrowing. It's, it's happening much more quickly, and presidents can influence the economy, contrary to what we used to think. They can drive that car. Is that true? If you look at sort of modern times in the United States, we had the 1970s, which, by the way, I, I lived through. I was a teenager in the 1970s. That was a period that a lot of people will remember where we had 20% mortgage interest rates and mm -hmm. double-digit inflation, and uh, you had uh, stagflation where you had rising inflation and rising unemployment, and it just felt like the wheels were coming off the economy. And that happened under uh, Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Carter. And <clears throat> this was the idea that if, if you just kept printing money, you know, that would lead to economic uh, activity and growth. And boy, wouldn't it be wonderful or that mm -hmm. easy. All you had to do was get the printing presses going and you could produce prosperity. But of course, if that, ha if that worked, then we'd see a lot of prosperity in uh, you know, places like Mexico and, sure. and, uh, and other nations that have had hyperinflation. And so <clears throat> those policies failed. And then Reagan came in in 1980 with a totally different kind of approach of <clears throat> let's cut tax rates. Let's uh, get government off the back of businesses. As he said in one sentence in his famous debate in 1980 against Jimmy Carter, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And that was sort of the defining uh, you know, axiom mm -hmm. of Reaganomics. And we did have a boom. We had a real boom. I mean, you want to see something amazing. Seven years of uninterrupted expansion. Yeah, well, not just that, yeah, but absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the real economy grew. Look at what happened, for example, to the stock market. I mean, people won't believe this, but in 1982, the bottom of the Dow Jones was 800. 800. Mm. You know, uh, then you go to 18 years later, because I think that was a whole period of prosperity under, under Reagan and Clinton. Yeah. And, and then the Dow hit like, you know, 11,000. So that's a gigantic increase in sure. wealth. Uh, and then I think we, we kind of faltered under Bush and Obama. And we had, you know, 15 or 16 straight years where you just didn't have much wage growth for Americans. And I, I happen to think that's the reason I, that uh, Donald Trump won the election, is that for middle class Americans, there just hadn't been a lot of progress, even though uh, in areas like Washington, D.C., where we are right now, or Wall Street, or Hollywood, or Silicon Valley, things were really good. Mm -hmm. A lot of areas of the country, I mean, I traveled with Donald Trump. We went to places in Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and Michigan, and West Virginia, the Rust Belt states. And when you ask people, you know, how's the recovery going for you, people would say, huh, what recovery are you talking about? Because they just hadn't felt it. And so that was real, really Trump's challenge, was how do you, how do you bring uh, prosperity and li rising living standards back to areas that have been left behind? And you know, it's early in his presidency, but so far he's shown, shown some pretty positive results. But there's a mystery there, there's a paradox lurking behind that, because what you've described, the effort of you know, just, just throwing money at the economy, Keynesianism, you, know, you dig a hole, and then you fill it up again, and somehow that injects money into the economy, and it 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 uh, it doesn't produce anything, so it doesn't really work. Well, the way I like to put it is that you know, in uh, 2009, right after we had the crash in the stock market and the crash in the real estate market, uh, Barack Obama is elected president, and we have this 800 billion dollar what they call the fiscal stimulus plan. Mm -hmm. It was based on Keynesian economics that if we just shovel this money into the economy or even you know dump it out of dump hundred dollar bills out of the windows Airplane. of helicopters over mm -hmm. cities that somehow that would cause you know a, a, a fast reaction to growth but it really didn't work very well I mean we had a we did have a recovery but it was a very slow growth kind of an anemic recovery and so I like to think you know that one of the legacies of the Obama presidency is to show that Keynesian economics really 
uh, is fiction. And, and, and then along comes uh, Reagan, who's a doctrinaire supply sider, and he's the opposite of those Keynesians, and he applies, you know, Friedmanite solutions, and it works. But uh, the paradox I want to point out, or the mystery to all this, is that whether they're from the left or the right, Friedman, Keynes, doesn't matter. The public debt just keeps ballooning and ballooning and ballooning. Nobody can rein it in. Um, and, and that's not the way it's supposed to work. But there's something about, there's something inherently expansionist about that debt, uh, like, like, a, like a runaway train. Well, my thinking has changed over the last 25 or 30 years about the debt. Now, do I like a big national debt? No. Um, it doesn't make me feel uncomfortable that we have a $20 trillion national debt. Yeah, it does, you know. But is it the biggest problem facing the country? I, I don't think so. I think the biggest problem facing the country you know, over the last decade or so has been anemic growth where people just didn't feel like they, their lives were getting better. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, I saw that, you know, I saw that in the streets of places like Erie, Pennsylvania, or places like Charleston, West Virginia, or places like Flint, Michigan, where just, you know, there was just no recovery whatsoever. And so I think that the debt, in my opinion, is a reflection of low debt, uh, low growth. In other words, we have a rising debt because the economy isn't growing. And one of the things that Reagan but used... Reagan really pumped it up. Pardon me? Well, he added a tremendous amount to that debt. Reagan did. Yeah. Sure he did. But, you know, we also had... Look, yeah, if you're going to look at the debt... But it wasn't supposed to be like that. That's my point. Uh, it was supposed to be a perfect world. Uh, lots of growth and, and a little debt didn't happen. Yes. So Reagan actually ran on balancing the budget. Yeah. And he never accomplished that. But he accomplished a lot of other goals mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the seven and a half years of prosperity. I would say this, though, that I think our our belief about the uh, debt and deficit should be changed. First, you have to get the economy booming. You got to get people back into work. You got to get people off of welfare. You got to have businesses forming so that they're paying taxes. Because I always tell candidates on, on the Democratic and Republican Party, look, you could take a chainsaw to the budget and you're not going to be able to cut the budget enough to balance the budget if you don't have a healthy economy. And I think Trump buys into that. And, and in the case of the, uh, of the U.S. economy, you have this tremendous advantage that uh, the dollar is the world currency. It does, sure. We, you know, we, have, uh, we have the benefit of being um, the one currency where people want to hold it. You know, wherever you go in the world, if you've got dollars in your pocket, you, know, you can exchange those, you can use those. Uh, and, and the other thing is, you know, we have another big benefit that's related to that, which is everybody wants to buy our bonds. It, it's like a shock absorber almost. You know, you buy a 10-year Treasury bond today, you're only going to get a 25 to 3% interest rate on that. And, and, and a few years ago, it was only a 2% interest rate on that. So that's an advantage the United States has, that people want to buy our bonds for low interest rates. Now, it was a much bigger problem when Reagan was president because we had had the high inflation. Those bonds were, you know, 15%. Sure. Yeah. So it's harder to reduce the debt when you've got these out-of-control interest rates. And, and we're blessed right now with those low interest rates. Of course, the question is, how long is that parade going to last? And, and, and another thing I was going to say, uh, uh, it wasn't that long ago that uh, pure conservatives like Steve Forbes would say, trust, trust no paper, get gold, go into gold. Uh, and now, it doesn't work anymore, gold is being abandoned. Does that mean that people really do trust the paper and believe it's going to be there for a long time? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, you're right, gold's done nothing for the mm. last... Uh, 12 years or so. And I, by the way, I happen to be one who was wrong about this. I thought that when we had the big increase in the money supply back in 2009 and 10 and 11 and 12, where the Fed really was just pumping money into the economy, you would have expected that to cause inflation. And I predicted we'd have inflation, mm -hmm. but we didn't. No. I was wrong. And I think the reason for that was, you know, another lesson we learned, because see, we learn these things as we observe them. I mean, economics is not an exact science, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what we now learned what happened is the Fed was shoving the money into the economy, trillions of dollars of it, but guess what? Americans weren't spending it. They were almost literally stuffing it under their mattress. Yeah. Well, if that happens... And, and companies too. And companies too. And so they weren't spending it. Now, if I give you $100 and you stuff it under your mattress, is that going to cause inflation? No, because you didn't spend it. And it won't create any prosperity either. Right, exactly. And one thing about the U.S. economy that is it's the theme of our series, free markets, one, one other great quality is the enormous uh, free market mechanisms that you've created. But uh, have we gone far enough? 
or is there still more work to be done? Sure, there's work to be done, but you know, we, we are, um, you know, we're, we're in pretty good shape economically right now. And we, we, we flirt with socialism. There's a big movement in the United States. I, I saw a poll the other day that a majority of college, recent college graduates think socialism is the way to go. That concerns me greatly because mm -hmm. I think one of the, I was friends, by the way, with Milton Friedman, who is probably, you know, other than uh, John Maynard Keynes, the greatest yeah, econ absolutely. economist of the 20th century. Yeah. And I was, you know, uh, privileged to be a friend of his. And, and, and Milton used to say, you know, the, what is the most enduring lesson of the 20th century? And I think it's pretty clear that the most important lesson we should have uh, all learned from uh, what happened in the 20th century is that free markets and free enterprise work and socialism, communism, Maoism, Hitlerism, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. those are failures. Yeah, uh, Margaret Thatcher used to say socialism says all the right things and then does all the wrong things. Yeah, exactly. And so what disturbs me a little bit is we, even though that's the lesson we hopefully all learn, and Milton Friedman used to say this, so why do we deduce from that all we need is a little bit more socialism? So, but we're, look, we're on a pretty good path right now, and, and I believe, you know, sometimes we do get off on the wrong course. We certainly did in the Great Depression in the mm -hmm. 1930s. We did in the 1970s. The last decade wasn't so good. But there's something in the DNA of Americans. We are rugged individualists. And we, we tend to want to have the and government leave us alone. And we're optimists, yeah. and we want to be essentially left alone. And Great we quality. want businesses to be able to do their thing. And I would say, you know, people always ask me, what is Trump's overriding economic philosophy? And I think it goes back to that point. Donald Trump, for better or worse, is pro-business. This is a businessman. Mm -hmm. He knows how business works. He knows how to make a payroll. He knows how to build buildings and things of that nature. And that positive attitude about businesses and how you make them grow is uh, very reassuring to people who are entrepreneurs, the mm -hmm. men and women who create, you know, great sure. businesses. 27 and a half million Americans own their own business. Did you know that? 27 no, and a half not. million. So we are a nation Quite of impressive. entrepreneurs. They are the spinal cord of the American economy. And, and now here's another uh, paradox. You mentioned the Great Depression. Um, over the years, interviewing economists and observers and financial journalists and everything, academics, about that period, about the Great Depression, one thing you would always hear is, oh, well, we're not going back to that. We've learned our lesson forever. Smoot Hawley, tariffs, protectionism, that's gone. We'll make new mistakes, of course, but we won't make that mistake again because it was so painful and then we're, it's burned into our brain cells never to touch tariffs and, and, and protectionism. Hey, what's going on? It, it is happening and nobody's apologizing for it. They're just going right ahead. They're not even saying, you know, this caused a Great Depression, but it won't this time. They're not saying a thing. They're just going barreling ahead. How come? Well, a couple of things. I mean, I'm smiling when you say that about Smoot-Hawley, because I agree with you, of course, but it's not universally accepted by economists. In fact, some of the economists that Donald Trump has surrounded himself uh, with do not believe that the, yeah, I know. that, the, that Smoot-Hawley caused the, ter the, the terrible Great Depression, uh, and that it was all these other factors. 1937. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but now, that, then the other question is, is Donald Trump a protectionist? And I asked that question because I used to ask him it myself. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, uh, you know, Mr. President, you have protectionist trade policies and things of that nature. And he would strike back at me. He would say, no, I am not a protectionist. I understand the value of international trade. I'm a businessman. I understand that global commerce is a good thing. But he would say, I just want a fair de deal for the United States. I want a level playing field. Same thing they said in the 30s. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you know, so, but I'm just telling you what Donald Trump is saying today. Mm -hmm. You know, and by the way, that the problem does become you get a, you get a tit for tat situation. We're going to put $50 billion of tariffs on China. Well, they're going to put $50 billion on us. Well, we're not going to buy your, uh, you know, your uh, toys and your uh, clothing. Okay, well, we're not going to buy your computers and so on. And mm -hmm. that's the definition of a trade war. Um, my point is, I still think the jury is out on Trump and whether this trade, he is upsetting the apple cart on trade, no question about it. He has a different doctrine. Mm -hmm. He's moved away from the you know, uh, laissez-faire free trade agreements, but it may be at the end of the day that because he's using this billy club of tariffs to try to threaten these other countries, it may actually intimidate them into cutting their tariffs. As long as he doesn't lose control of the whole thing as it unfolds. I mean, it's, it's quite dangerous. 
So it's a dangerous game. It's a risky game that Donald Trump is playing. But my point is, uh, you know, let's see how this works. Uh, because he may win. And if he gets those tariffs down, you know, he's been talking lately about zero tariffs. Let's everybody yes, I know. I lower the tariffs to zero. Well, that would be quite a big victory for free trade. You, you wrote a piece on it. Yes. And I was curious about one thing, um, because I, I've interviewed him three times, and it went extremely well. It was very nice and, and courteous and civilized and elegant and all that. Um, and, and, and he had a lot to say. Um, but it was in a different era and he was in a different uh, business. I didn't have to confront him on anything. But when you go into the Oval Office and you have to tell him, well, Mr. President, this is wrong, or I really can't recommend this, or I disagree, um, what do you get, a brick bat? You know, he, Donald Trump is a very engaging person. He really is. And he likes the kind of fisticuffs, the back and forth. And he, you know, he would say, look, when I'm talking about trade, I have four or five trade representatives, and they all have different views. And he likes that. He likes to have, you know, Larry Kudlow says for free trade. And, uh, you know, Peter Navarro says, no, we got to get tough with China. And, and he likes to absorb all this information and mm -hmm. then make his own choice. Donald Trump is not ideological. I mean, Ronald Reagan was an ideological conservative. Barack Obama was an uh, ideological liberal. Donald Trump doesn't look at the world in conservative liberal dynamics. He looks at the world as, does this make sense? So he doesn't get mad at you? Pardon? When you contradict him, he doesn't get mad? No, no, he doesn't. No, although he is very thin-skinned. The, the pre president has called me at least t twice to say, hey, Steve, why did you say that about me on CNN or Fox News or whatever it is? And, and I always laugh and say, Mr. President, 90% of the things I say about you are, you know, wonderful. And then you always call yeah, me about yeah. that two or three times <laughs> I say something that where I disagree with you. And it's interesting, and it gives me it gives me uh, a chance to pay tribute a little bit to your work because as a pundit, uh, because one of the things I like about the stuff you do on television is that it's not predictable and boring like so many of these pundits. They're all very competent. They all know their subject, but they've got the team logo on their sweater and you see them coming a mile away, doesn't matter if it's MSNBC or Fox or CNN, they're always um, coming at you with the line. In your case, sometimes we'd see your name and you'd think, oh, this is going to be the Trump line, the Trump version of what the other guy said, the opposite. Um, but actually, no, you, you, you had your own line. And I think it's, it's honestly it's to, to your credit and makes your work much more interesting. I think this is the problem with uh, the United States today. It's, it's what really troubles me about most about the country is this complete polarization. Mm. And you're either on one side or the other. And, you know, neither side is, you know, even able to converse with each other. I mean, that's a dangerous yeah. tinderbox situation. Uh, and so, look, I mean, I don't, I always tell Donald Trump, and I told him this from when, when he first started to ask me if I wanted to be a senior economic advisor. And I said, Sure, but I don't agree with you on A, B, and C. He said, okay, but let's work together on the things we do agree on. But, but this problem of, you know, you're either in the hate Trump camp or you love him and there's no in between, that's not a healthy situation for our body politic or our culture. And this mirrors something that's going on on a deep level, I think, in American society, American culture. Um, you know, Main Street versus Wall Street, as they used to say. I agree with that. So there's this cleavage that has entered American society, and it's deep, and it's not a good thing, and you kind of wonder how's it going to get solved. That, well, that's for sure. The other thing that's going on in the country that's related to this that people aren't paying enough attention to is that we are more geographically divided, too. Mm -hmm. So I, I've written several books on this about the states and what's happened, and this, if anything, this process is accelerating. Conservatives are moving to southern states and red the states. Heartland. Liberals are moving to the northeast and to the coast. And so that's a problem, too, because you don't even have, you know, a lot of liberals don't even know anybody who voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. A lot of conservatives don't know anybody who didn't vote for him. Yeah. You know, no. so it's just a, it's, it's not a healthy situation because we are so polarized right now. And look, one of the, I think Donald Trump has done a lot of wonderful things for our economy. I think one of the things he could do a much better job at as president, and I would say it's really so a critical uh, mission of our president is to bring us together. Don't be a divider. Try to find ways to bring even the people who disagree with you. Which uh, Reagan did. Reagan did it. I, I would say that Obama could have done it, and he should have done it, because he could have been, I think, a much more successful president. And so, you know, we've shifted. We went from a very liberal president, and now we've got a very conservative president who kind of seesawing back and forth. And all this has turned the national priorities 
on their head, uh, so to speak. Uh, it used to be that getting the economy right was the tough thing, and you had to you had to work very very hard at that. And if you had that, and the economy worked, everything else flowed from that. Uh, but now the economy is humming, and things are not flowing from that. I mean, look, the, most of the American people still think it's the economy stupid, mm -hmm. to uh, quote James Carville, who was the uh, Bill mm -hmm. Clinton uh, political director. Um, and I do think in the end of the day, you know, if you ask people, do you feel good about, you know, your finances and the way the country is going, as if the economy is doing better, people tend to feel better about things. Um, but it's not the only thing that matters. No. And, you know, the, uh, a lot of our problems today in the United States are more cultural than they are economic. And, and so we're seeing, for instance, a very old idea come back because there's this unease in general and, and nobody can exactly figure out what's going on. Now people are talking increasingly a lot about the average wage, uh, which, is, which is a measure that goes back to the Middle Ages, uh, so it's pretty reliable. Um, and they're not going up. Uh, and, and so people are focusing on that when they could be focusing on all the good stuff, but, but the wages obsess them because they feel it hurts them. Um, and, and, and this to me is a new development. The word keeps getting repeated and repeated. A few years ago, people didn't think in those terms. Okay, so I'm gonna challenge you a little bit on that, okay? So you're exactly right. You know, this is, the, this is Economics 100 in about uh, uh, 90 seconds. So throughout most of mankind, up until, you know, from before the birth of Christ through about the mid 18th century, there was almost no increase in living mm -hmm. standards. You know, people were as poor in 1600 as they were in the year 200. Uh, and then we saw this burst of, uh, of uh, living standards and, and uh, growth. And that, of course, was what we now call the Industrial Revolution. And that lasted, uh, you know, for, you know, well over a century, and we saw this massive increase. And so you just saw the living standards of people all over the planet go up dramatically. And the cool thing about being alive now, today, is that people um, are, we're in the digital age. And the digital age is like the industrial age, only it's happening five times faster. Mm -hmm. And think about how your life has changed oh. in 30 years. Yeah. I mean, that's why I reject this idea. People say, oh, you know, wages haven't risen 30 years. Wait a minute. Are you saying a worker isn't as well off uh, today as they were 30 years ago? Because if you believe that, you're dead wrong. It's a productivity. It's productivity. It's think of the things that we have that you know that we didn't have before. Oh, the whether it's computers, yeah. whether it's you know uh, you know cell phones, whether it's modern uh, medicine, and you know the the uh, the air that we breathe is cleaner. All of these things are, are uh, signs of incredible progress. And and my belief is, I just wish I were you know 20 years old, not nearly 60 yeah. years old, because I think you're going to see amazing things happen. No, no, no. The medicine will catch up with us, and, uh, and we'll be the first to benefit from it, and uh, we'll live to be 150. That is a big issue now is, is, you know, will people live to, you know, well over 100, you know, and I, I don't want to live that long personally, but, you know, it could, it could happen. If they can start regenerating brain cells, yeah, yeah you could have that, um, you know, have that happening. But Yeah, we'll try that in the Oval Office. <laughs> Toss out the idea. <laughs> Maybe that's how Donald Trump, I mean, I have to say this about Donald Trump, he is, he, he has, um, you know, the energy level of a 25-year-old and he's 71 years old. So, uh -huh. you know, maybe he, he is regenerating oh, right. <laughs> Maybe he's got the secret and, he, and, and he's using it on himself and he's not sharing <laughs> yeah. it with us. Well, Stephen Moore, I wish it upon us and I wish it upon you and this has been great and, and many thanks and long life. Great to be with you.